engineering, medicine, medicine. chemistry, physics, biology, humanity, cardiology, computer, public health, global science, Hello everyone, I'm Gareth Mitchell. Coming up in this edition, broken hearts and sleepless flies. Those are stories in our news section. And speaking of news, how do you tackle a problem like fake news? One of our reporters has been investigating and she's sitting here right now, ready to tell you all about it. Also in this edition, aviation safety, where the skies are getting fuller. Commercial, private planes, and yes, drones. Go to an airfield these days and you'll see pilots with tablet computers in their flight bags. All very useful, but, says one of our researchers... The downside of of the tablet is that the way that the positioning of the aircraft is, is calculated, there can be some um, errors in the measurements. And that can also mean that the aircraft uh, flies in control airspace, whilst the pilot sees on the tablet that the aircraft is outside. Also today, we hear the latest on that exciting Mars InSight mission. Okay, let's jump in with some news. Kate Whiten's here, and you're going to be talking about, um, what, broken hearts, is it? So just set this one up for us. This is some really amazing research, which is exactly that, looking to mend broken hearts. What scientists have done at Imperial, at our Cardiovascular Regenerative Medicine Centre, which is funded by the British Heart Foundation, is they're making these pumping patches of heart muscle. And these patches are about the size of a plaster, so they're about three centimetres by five centimetres. And the idea is that these can be sewn onto the hearts of patients who've had heart attack. Because at the moment, we're really good at saving people from heart attacks. But the follow-up treatment, we still need to boost a little bit because what will often happen to heart attack survivors, uh, there's 1.3 million heart attack survivors living in the UK, is that they'll then develop heart failure. So from the damage from the heart attack, it damages the muscle and it means that the heart can't quite pump properly. That's heart failure. Uh, It's incurable at the moment and it does tend to get worse over time. So the idea is that with these patches, they stick them onto the heart when not only do they provide kind of structural support to help the heart pump better and make it stronger, but they also release these compounds which trigger the heart muscle to repair and regenerate. So they're testing them at the moment, and the idea is that perhaps even in as little as two years' time, they'll be in patient trials where you've had a patient who's had a heart attack, they'll be prescribed drugs, but they'll also have this patch which can be made from their own cells. So you can just take a few skin cells from a patient, reverse engineer them to stem cells, and then make them into heart cells. So they'll have this pumping patch of heart cells that they just whack onto the patient's heart and will hopefully prevent and treat heart failure. Wow, so we'll look out for those trials as they go forward. Uh, Just briefly then, there is some video available. How do we find it then, Kate? So if you go onto the Imperial College news site, there is a story there with very cool videos which have lots of clips of these pumping patches. Or if you go on the college's Twitter or Facebook accounts, they'll be on there as well. Great. Kate Whiten, thank you very much indeed for that. Now also here at the table is Hayley Dunning. And Hayley, what's all this I've been hearing about sleepless flies? Yeah, so some of our researchers have been conducting an experiment that might sound a little bit cruel, but shown us some really interesting results. So they've got thousands of fruit flies, and they've got this kind of automatic setup where the flies are in little glass tubes. And they have automatic monitoring of them, so if the flies don't move for more than 20 seconds, they'll rotate the tube and wake them up. So why might you want to keep flies awake? Well, the researchers are trying to find out whether sleep is actually vital for staying alive. And what they found with these flies is they did this throughout their entire lives and they found that on average, most of the flies didn't actually die any sooner than flies that were allowed to sleep normally. So that infers something about flies, but in terms of the bigger picture then, what, I mean, what does that tell us about the significance of and the importance of sleep? It's interesting because obviously flies are a long way from us as humans, but sleep is something that happens all over the animal kingdom. You know, every animal sleeps. And the question is, is whether it's the same kind of vital that food is. If we don't get food, we know that we can't power ourselves and power our bodies and therefore we die. But we don't actually know what function sleep serves in terms of keeping us alive. 
Now, obviously, out in the wild, if we if we do have a lack of sleep, then other factors because of that lack of sleep might make us die. You know, we're more likely to crash our cars. Flies who don't sleep in the wild are probably more likely to be eaten by predators because they're just, you know, they're a bit dozy. They're not so aware. But in terms of the actual vital part of it, it might be that sleep is not completely vital. Fascinating. Hayley, thank you so much for that. Rounding off the uh, news section for this edition. And indeed, speaking of news now, how tackling fake news is just one of the research areas here at Imperial. And in the very week this podcast comes out, the issue is at the top of the agenda as MPs speak out. A Commons committee says that Facebook has failed to show leadership or responsibility in tackling the fake news problem. There are calls for stricter regulation. And as for the research side of things, there are people here developing algorithms for tracing how false content spreads around the internet. The patterns by which information spreads can give as many clues as the actual content of the messages. At least that's what they're saying. Bernadetta Dadanaiti has been looking into this. She joins me now in the studio. And of course, fake news, it's always on the agenda at the moment. It's a really big uh, deal. So who at Imperial is looking into all this? So at Imperial, we actually have quite a few researchers who are interested in the problem of misinformation online. One of them is Julio Amador, who's a fellow at Imperial College business school. I believe what has happened is that armies such as Russia, China, North Korea, the United States, you know, have been developing weapons to try to influence. And actually, you know, like in in the very first study of the uh, U.S. election two years ago, what we saw is that the influence of bots and misleading actors in, in social network Twitter was very much like a propaganda campaign from Russia during the Cold War. So the thing is that it has become weaponized, let's say, and right now it's just a matter of national security in terms of protecting each country's institutions and not trying to intervene in that sense. Right, so that's Julio Amador. So, Bernadetta, this obviously is about national security in many cases. It's that big a deal. So what has Julio's research found so far? So there are really two key things to think about why people tend to trust some information more than other information. The first thing is familiarity. So if people are familiar with something that is being stated, then they're more likely to trust it, which kind of seems obvious. And the second one is belief. So if some information is provided to you by a person who holds similar beliefs to you, say similar political views, you are also more likely to trust them. So Julio Amador, who we heard there, is not the only one here at Imperial who's looking into this. Who else have you been speaking to? So I also have spoken to Professor Michael Bronstein, who is the chair of machine learning and pattern recognition in Imperial's Department of Computer Sciences. And so I asked Michael to explain how his sort of background in computer sciences allows him to learn more about fake news. Roughly speaking, we can distinguish between content-based approaches and some meta-approaches that look at the way that the news spreads. So content-based approaches essentially try to find some linguistic or semantic cues in the content of the news piece itself that will tell whether the piece of news is fake or true. This is, I would say... uh, basically almost a lost battle because those who fake the news become increasingly more sophisticated, so it's very difficult even for humans to tell uh, truth from fake apart. And basically, fake news is a very subtle thing because you can take true information and present it in a way that it becomes misleading. Instead, we are looking at the way that uh, the news spread on social networks. There is quite strong evidence that fake news propagate in different ways and these ways can be learned. So we employ a new type of machine learning technology that we call geometric deep learning that can be applied to graph structure data, in this case social networks, and we can learn the patterns that characterize fake news and true news. So that's Michael Bronstein. He's developing that algorithm to detect misinformation. So what are the advantages of using this pattern detection approach? Right. So really looking at the pattern and how it spreads allow you to be much more versatile. Not only can you then look perhaps on the written text, but also you can apply same algorithms for things like video content and audio content and even, well, perhaps in the future for the problem of the infamous deep fakes and such. But what we haven't spoken about yet, though, is is regulation. That has to be a part of the solution, government regulation. Yeah, and it's really a difficult problem because there's a grey line between proper regulation and, and maybe even censorship. 
if you think that government should be perhaps responsible for regulating fake news, then the problem might be that we really come back to this propaganda campaign. But I'm happy to sort of hear that really researchers are thinking hard about this problem as well. I don't think that I'm ready to take any position in this regard, but probably what the government should do is to promote education of people on how uh, to deal with sources of information, maybe uh, information, maybe develop some kind of critical thinking when it comes to new sources, to do some even simple fact-checking or verification of stories before blindly trusting, I think. Social networks are maybe involuntarily are contributing to this problem because basically they magnify our biases by well, they are obviously driven by commercial reasons, but they present to us more and more information that we tend to like. But I'm pretty much against censorship, explicit or implicit. All right. So Michael mentioned education there and just trying to break that cycle of amplifying their biases by always clicking on the same kinds of stories, you know, the infamous filter bubble problem. And you took this a bit further in terms of what our own responsibilities are here. You took that further with um, Julia Amador, didn't you? Um, Yeah, so because we really have, every one of us, we consume the online content, so we have to take our own responsibility. I really asked Julio for some tips on how to catch that fake tweet. I would say, you know, the way if if it's reading a lot of hyperbole is usually a a good indication of something, of someone trying to impose on you a view on something. Uh, The way in which information is detailed, so, you know, like the detail in which facts are described, so those are a good indication of something might something fishy might be going on. Julio Amador speaking there to Bernadetta Dadanaiti. Thank you very much to Bernadetta for that. You can read more on that topic on our news website in Bernadetta's piece, Tackling the Fake News Problem, and you can find it via imperial.ac.uk slash news. Well now, have a safe flight. That's the tagline to the work of one of our researchers in our LRF Transport Risk Management Centre. Eleanor Silu is looking at airspace infringements and how new technologies can help to reduce the risk of collisions in our increasingly busy airspace. Eleanor's going to be at our Wonder Women Late event in March, but Hayley Dunning couldn't wait that long, so she caught up with Eleanor just now. There's definitely a challenge for us to ensure that all the flights fly in uh, places that they are meant to fly and they follow the airspace uh, procedures. In your research, you talk about commercial airlines, but also general aviation. So what comes under general aviation? General aviation is pretty much all the civil operations that are not commercial which covers a wide spectrum of operations from business aviation to recreational flights. And that's where, yes, things start to get a bit complicated. So what kind of things influence pilots when they accidentally stray into airspace they're not supposed to be in? Let's take the example of um, a congested airspace like London, which where most of the infringements happened by uh, these small aircraft. Uh, so the um, airspace is mostly controlled in order to cater for the commercial aviation. So the pilots um, that they fly in what we call uncontrolled airspace or Class G airspace, they fly in a small, narrow aerospace, which means that they fly at a very close distance to the control uh, airspace. And considering the impact of the wind during the flight, the flight can stray into the control airspace. But there are also some uh, other sorts of things, for example, the navigation equipment that the pilots use. If we look on how the pilots look for other traffic when they fly, they pretty much rely on their eyes to visually detect traffic and conflict and also to identify their position compared to the terrain. So yeah, it is important here to remember that general aviation uses what we call analog cockpit and they don't have all this fancy equipment that a commercial aircraft has. Is that one way that we can prevent further infringements in airspace by having better and more specific technologies? So more and more pilots uh, use tablets to navigate. Now, the downside of of the tablet is that the way that the positioning of the aircraft is is calculated, the reliability of the measurements cannot be ensured and there can be some um, errors in the measurements. And that can also mean that the aircraft uh, flies in control airspace whilst the pilot sees on the tablet that 
the aircraft is outside. I guess we're in a transition phase. Tablets as they are at the moment might not be what would be perfect for the pilots, but they pave the way for new technologies to to come in that they're going to be also cost effective. So our airspaces are getting more crowded with commercial and with private flight, but also drones. They shut down some airports before Christmas. How does your knowledge of airspace infringements transfer to drone technology? Well, it's early to say, but definitely raising awareness of the implications of such an infringement can cause to the airports across the wider public, not just the aviation community, will help a lot. But let's not forget that there are many types of operations uh, that use unmanned operations. They vary from the home activities with the small drones that we got for Christmas presents, but also the bigger ones that they're used for other purposes for, for transport. Presumably we know that infringements take place because we can track aircraft, but are there aircraft that slip through the cracks, infringements that we might not know are happening? And I assume that happens with drones too. Well, that's actually correct. The current infrastructure that we have in aviation detects big metallic objects that are also of big size, let's say. And so small drones that are made of plastic are difficult to detect. But going back to general aviation, there are also some aircraft that are not detected, like ultralight aircraft, like microlight, what we call it uh, here in the UK, and also gliders. How do you think we could try to identify these other types of aircraft in the future? Well, uh, other researchers in technologies and engineering, they're looking ways to detect these undetected aircraft by using yeah, new technologies. But if we take the example of gliders, they install a device that is specifically used for gliders. And we can also make uh, use of uh, satellites to identify the position of this aircraft. So following on from your research project, are you taking that into the real world? Oh, well, actually, yes. And I'm working with the Canadian Civil Aviation Authority, Transport Canada, and the Canadian Association of of Pilots. They launched a campaign a couple of years ago, and I am actively contributing to their campaign. I'm a member of their working groups, and I'm transferring all these findings that I found during my research into their campaign, in particular with regards to the use of tablets and the airspace infringements. That's Eleanor Siley speaking to Hayley Dunning. And you can meet Eleanor and the other Wonder Women at the Imperial Lates event on Thursday the 7th of March. It starts at 6 in the college main entrance and you can register for free by going to imperial.ac.uk slash festival and then just click on Imperial Lates. Well, now to Mars exploration. NASA announced the demise of the Opportunity rover last week, but as one mission ends, another's just getting really exciting. The scientific community is bracing itself for measurements of Mars quakes, yes, vibrations under the red planet to be picked up by a seismometer on board NASA's Mars InSight that landed in November. And if they do find the quakes, it could give us unprecedented insight into the red planet's inner workings and give us clues about the origins of the solar system itself. Imperial researchers have been involved in delivering that seismometer. Professor Tom Pike and his colleagues at the University of Oxford designed and developed it. The seismometer and InSight's other instruments are now safely on the rocky ground of Mars. So Caroline Brogan has been hearing about progress so far from Professor Pike on one of his rare trips home from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. Altitude convergence, the radar has locked on the ground. Yes. You were obviously there when InSight landed. What was the atmosphere like? Standing by for lander separation. We were there watching it come down on the JPL monitors. The the radar was counting down the metres. 200 metres. 180 metres. 60 60. meters and your heart is absolutely in your mouth because it's those rocks right at the end that is what could kill you even if everything has gone perfectly up to that point 17 meters standing by for touchdown touchdown confirmed (laughs) when we got the message zero meters it's landed 
the relief was absolutely incredible because I've been working on the instruments for 25 years on this mission for the best part of a decade and finally we knew that we were on the surface and you always have this contingency what if it fails what am I going to do for the rest of my life and suddenly your life switches you now know what is going to happen waiting for Mars quakes and it is captured in just those few seconds so when we first turned on our instruments, the very first data that we got back was very clear that we were sensing the wind. We played this sound back through loudspeakers. And as we did this, although it was very low, we realized that for the first time, we were actually recording the sound of Mars. The ultimate goal of InSight is to detect Mars quakes. When do you expect that we will have our first Mars quake? That is the, I think, literally the one billion dollar question. <laughs> We have some very broad estimates. On one side, we have the Earth with plate tectonics, and that provides maybe an upper estimate of the activity we would expect on Mars. However, Mars doesn't appear to have plate tectonics. On the other hand, if we look at the Moon, we had moonquakes. They were much less frequent, but frequent enough that the Apollo seismometers were able to detect actually hundreds of them. So we're expecting Mars to be in the range of the seismic activity of Earth and of the Moon. We've been down a little bit now, so we're certainly not expecting now hundreds, but we are expecting maybe dozens of Mars quakes. If I knew exactly when we would have a Mars quake, we would know exactly when to publish our papers, but we just have to be patient. We are looking deep inside of the planet with the seismometers, but another aspect that we really need to understand about Mars is how much heat is being produced inside of the planet. This is, if you like, taking the temperature of Mars, and to do that, we need to get a little below the surface. In fact, three to five meters is just about deep enough. The main job of the mole is to take that temperature. And what will you be doing with that information? What InSight is really trying to do, and for the first time, is to get a better idea of what is inside another planet. We want to get effectively a slice through the planet, and to do that we're using this combination of a seismic station to measure the vibrations that come through from Mars quakes. What will that mean for Mars if we find that there are Mars quakes? We're after understanding whether Mars has a liquid core, how thick its mantle is, how thick the crust is, and being able to contrast that with Earth so that we build up a better idea of how solar systems develop. What we know is that very early on in the development of the solar system, the planets formed and they then differentiated. They formed cores and mantles and crust. At least that is what we know happened on the Earth. What variant on the story is there for the other rocky planets? That's Mars, Earth, Venus and Mercury. The ones that, at least in one instance, are excellent habitats for life, how did they form? How did they differentiate during the early evolution of the solar system? In some ways, we can look at InSight as allowing us to travel back in time. Could Mars InSight's findings have implications for previous life on Mars? So it's a very dry planet. It's lost most of its atmosphere. We know from the other rovers that early on in Mars's history, it was a wetter and warmer planet. So something went wrong as far as life is concerned and it lost its atmosphere and one of the the clues as to why that might have happened is right down in the core of the planet on earth we have a magnetic field and that magnetic field deflects the solar wind that otherwise would strip off the atmosphere of the earth you need liquid core to circulate the currents that produce a magnetic field so the question is is there any remnant of a liquid core left how long ago does that say the magnetic field collapsed? And again, what does that tell us about how planets might evolve, how they're able to keep the magnetic field to protect their atmosphere? And that atmosphere, in the end, is what stops a planet becoming dry and barren, which is what we see on Mars today. It's not really going to help in terms of identifying which niche on Mars where life might still hang on. It's a much larger scale, deep time sort of perspective that we're getting here. 
Tom Pike speaking there to Caroline Brogan. Exciting times ahead for Mars Insight, I suspect, and we will tell you all about it on this podcast as the news emerges. Other news and other happenings from around Imperial College are, of course, on our splendid news website. Do go and check it out. It's imperial.ac.uk slash news. And don't forget that Imperial Late Wonder Women event. That's on Thursday, the 7th of March. And you can register for free by going to the Imperial Festival website and then just check out Imperial Lates and then you can just get yourself signed up. And we hope to see you there. As for this podcast, I'll be back in a month's time. I'm Gareth Mitchell saying thank you very much indeed for listening. And I'll see you next time. Take care and goodbye.